Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to SNS and today's seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Gustav Blancarsen, and I work as a project manager here at SNS. Um, today's seminar is uh, part of our collaboration with uh, the Institute for International Economic Studies at Stockholm University. Um, and the aim of this collaboration is to, to bring insight from leading international economists to the Swedish policy debate. And that's why we have you, Marianne, here today, and uh, that's what we hope to do today at this seminar. Um, so first today, uh, Marianne Bertrand, uh, Professor of Economics at the University uh, of Chicago Booth School of Business, uh, will present her research on uh, gender differences uh, in the labor market, uh, more specifically uh, why women remain uh, underrepresented in the upper part of the earnings distribution. And then we have with us um, Johanna Rikne, uh, Professor of Economics at uh, the Swedish Institute for Social Research at Stockholm University, um, SUFI in Swedish, and uh, Joachim Tåg, um, Program Director at the Research Institute for Industrial Economics uh, in Swedish uh, EFN. Um, and they will comment on this issue from a Swedish perspective. Um, the seminar is moderated by Robert Essling from uh, the, the Institute for International Economic Studies. Um, and before I hand over to you, uh, I just want to remind everyone that you are very welcome to share what's said in here today on social media. And if you do so, please use our hashtag, SNS Kunskap, um, to, to spread the word. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to hand over to you, Robert. Thank you. My name is Robert. Uh, I will try to talk as little as possible, so we don't have so much time. So Joachim, Johanna, and Marianne, especially, should uh, get uh, as much time as possible. Remind you about the hashtag. Also remind you about turning off the sound of your telephones. Um, so I hardly think Marianne needs an extra introduction. So she is a leading economist in labor economics and corporate finance. Um, and she is also an, I would say one of the world leading experts on understanding um, gendered labor markets and the issues related to the gender gap and the glass ceiling. Uh, so we are very, very happy to have you here, Marianne. And uh, you will have 30 minutes for your talk now. Is it good? All right, great. Thanks so much for having me over. All right, so I think it's going to work. Yes. So, I mean, I think in terms of background, um, there is absolutely no doubt. If you like, look at the last half century, women have made just tremendous progress. Um, it's true when it comes to educational achievement. I'll show you some evidence on this. It's also true in terms of like women's steady uh, increase in uh, labor force participation. And there's also evidence that in terms of earnings, the gender gap in earnings has been, uh, has been going down. So all that is is true, and it's true throughout the developed world. I mean, I think the, the patterns when it comes to education are by far the most striking. I'm going to show you lots of U.S. data here. I'll show you also some non-U.S. data, but it will be U.S. mainly. This is the U.S., and this is looking by birth cohorts um, and is plotting uh, the share of men and women in each of these birth cohorts that have uh, completed at least a college degree. And you, can, you have to go back to the mid-1950s to have uh, more men um, kind of having completed college degree than, than women. Since then, there's been a huge reversal. Uh, and in fact, you know, in the U.S., the trend is flat, maybe even somewhat down for men, and women keep on uh, getting more and more educated. It is true throughout the world. I've used, you know, kind of Norwegian data for other work. I think these patterns are even more extreme in Norway than they are uh, than they are in the U.S. I haven't seen the, the Swedish data, but that's, I think, a fact. Women are getting more and more educated. And to, be, to be honest, I don't think we have a good understanding of what's going on, in particular with men's um, uh, educational um, outcomes. All right, so there's a large literature, which I'm not going to talk about, that has tried to explain why, you know, kind of women have made such steady progress over the last half century, talking a lot about, you know, technological innovation from, you know, what's happening in terms of contraception to what's happening inside of our homes with dishwashers and washing machines. And these forces, without a doubt, have contributed to what's been happening in terms of uh, women's labor market progress. Now, my focus over the next few minutes is going to be more about what's happening at the very top of the income distributions. And there, despite all this steady progress, 
It remains true that women are underrepresented in the higher earnings, higher status occupations in the economy, and whenever you find them in these occupations, they tend to earn less than men in those high earnings, high status occupations. So this can be illustrated via many means. This is the kind of data that people constantly look at in the U.S. to make this fact. This is data that Catalyst uh, records every year, and this is the share of um, Fortune 500 companies that are headed by CEOs. So you can look at this and say, well, there's been infinite progress in that the share went from zero to uh, a number that's slightly bigger than zero, but it remains true today that less than 5% of um, kind of large companies in the U.S. are, are chaired by women. And again, um, Having done some work in Norway, I, I know these patterns are quite similar uh, in, uh, in Scandinavia as well. This is not a U.S. Uh, phenomenon. This is um, data that um, Piketty and co-authors have put together uh, using earnings records. So the beauty of the earnings record is that in the U.S. it's hard to really look at what's happening at the very top of income distribution because all of our kind of administrative data sets are top-coded. This is IRS data that does not, su that does not uh, suffer from the top-coding. And this is the share of women in the top 10%, top 1%, top 0, 1% of the, uh, of the earnings distribution, if it was equal representation, given that we are about at 50% of women working, you would want 50% of women in the top 10, top 1, top 0, 1. It is far from that. And I think what's also remarkable is that while there's been progress essentially between the 1980s and the, the 2000, these, you know, these lines seem to be also flattening uh, over the last um, 15 to, uh, to 20 years. This is a picture, and I'm going to go back to this picture uh, in the past that Claudia Goldin put together for a presidential, presidential lecture at the, at the American Economic Association a few years back. And what this picture does is essentially plotting um, each each. Each dot on this graph is one of the highest uh, earnings occupation in the country. There's about 80 dots on this graph. The different colors slash shapes correspond to different sectors of the economy. And what this picture shows you is that there is a systematic relationship between how high earnings an occupation is, which you see on the x-axis. So the farther you go in this dimension, the higher the average earnings in the occupation and the size of the gender gap. So that means that in those high higher earnings occupations, when you find women, the higher earnings the occupation is, the bigger the pay gap is between men and women. Women tend to under-earn, especially in the highest earnings occupation in the economy. All right. So there's a why should we care slide here. Um, maybe I don't want to spend so much time on it here. I think you care, I think, from a very different perspective. I think some people look at this and care about it from a pure fairness perspective. Right? It should be like, you know, women are educated. We should not be seeing those kind of difference. So it's kind of all the fairness argument. I think the other argument that I think people make less often is really also an efficiency argument. Right? So if you think, and I'm going to stand and say that I believe that, that, you know, kind of women are born, are born with the same talent distribution as men, we must be, as an economy, leaving a lot on the table by having, you know, the leaders of all the large corporations essentially being, uh, being solely men. So I think there's really also an efficiency argument that needs to be made as to why we should care about this question. Um, Another argument that you know you often hear is that there another efficiency type argument is that they could benefit to have more diverse uh, leadership in organization. And I should say, one often hear this argument in policy circles. There is really not good academic uh, research that can point at that would substantiate the value of this second efficiency argument. But the middle one, I strongly, uh, I strongly stand by. All right. So what I want to do in the rest of the time is kind of like tell you a little bit about what, where the research stand as to why, you know, we still have this glass ceiling um, and what the most recent uh, research say. I also have, you know, kind of in the long version of this talk, a discussion of like, okay, so given what we understand about what's behind the glass ceiling, what do we do about it? That's more of a policy question. I'm not going to spend time on this, but I'm sure that that will come up uh, in the conversation. My focus is going to be more on like, why? Why do we still have those, uh, those patterns? All right, so let me tell you that over the last maybe you know 15 years maybe two decades there's been a lot of focus on whether some type of 
psychological differences between men and women could be uh, a sole, an important driver of the glass ceiling. And the way this research has worked is that it has started with a lot of lab-based type evidence suggesting that there are some systematic differences between men and women on psychological traits that might be relevant to the glass ceiling. So in particular, I think there's some fairly robust research documenting that women are more risk-averse than men. There's also research which I think is related to this risk aversion um, point that suggests that women uh, may do more poorly than men in environments that are more competitive and may dislike being in those kind of more competitive environments. There's research that suggests that women do not negotiate as much as men, and there's also research that suggests that there's a confidence gap between men and women. And I think you can look at this research two ways. You could say that this research suggests that women lack confidence. Another way to look at this research is that men are overconfident uh, in their uh, in their ability. So that's work that's been going on for you know for a while. What has been much more recent is being trying to bring this work outside of the lab and into the field to try to say, okay, so how much of this does matter in practice? If I want to explain the gender gap in earnings, how much can uh, can be uh, can, uh, how, what fraction of it can be accounted for by uh, by these gender differences in psychological traits? Now, and the reason, just just to add one thing, the reason why this could be relevant, take risk aversion, right? So if women are more risk averse than men, and if there is, and in fact there is, a systematic relationship between how uh, unstable earning is within a certain occupation and how high average earning is in this occupation, well, you may have, you know, um, a consequence of that might be to see fewer women selecting into these higher earnings, but more unstable earnings occupations. So this is why this could be relevant to the glass ceiling. Now, the work that has been happening more recently trying to assess how much of this matters in practice, I think this work is not done. But my reading of this evidence so far is that, yes, it does matter. Yes, we have evidence that these psychological traits may explain, you know, women selecting different kind of majors in college, may explain different kind of occupational uh, sorting. But the magnitudes are very small. I would say the magnitudes are such that I do not look at this literature and believe that this is the core explanation for uh, for what's going on, and we can talk about it, you know, more later. All right. So what I want to focus on, in, you know, instead is is this, which is um, kind of women's kind of greater demand for flexibility, and that sounds like you know an old explanation, but. I think the data is more and more telling us that this is still the central explanation for what's, uh, what's driving um, um, the glass ceiling. So if you think about the highest occupations in the economy, as paying occupations in the economy, they tend to be characterized by long hours. They tend to be characterized by fairly uh, inflexible schedules. Those are also the kind of occupations where you cannot leave your work for you know a few months and hope to be able to re-enter where you are. The idea that uh, you can easily stay on the fast track within those occupations if you take some kind of time off is uh, not confirmed uh, in the data. And now, because women remain the dominant providers of home production activities, in particular childcare, the argument is that this inflexibility uh, is particularly detrimental uh, to them. So what I'm going to try to show you is some evidence that suggests that there's really some, uh, some truths behind uh, the hypothesis that I just stated here. Okay, this is back to work that I did, no gosh, a really long time ago with um, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. What we looked at in this work was um, essentially um, kind of a panel uh, data set that tracked the earnings of male and female graduates of the business school that I, uh, that I work at. What's appealing with this kind of data is that these men and women that we tracked over time, they are essentially the same. They were all good enough to be admitted in our school. So the kind of concerns you have about an observed selection in, you know, kind of bigger data set is not existing here. These are all men and women that were qualified enough to get into, uh, into the booth school. And what this data, you know, suggests is that the gender gap in earnings among this fairly homogenous group of individuals, while very small at the time where, uh, where they leave the MBA program, grows dramatically over time. And obviously, you know, the difference in means are always going to be much bigger than the difference in median earnings. The difference in means by you know, 10 years out of um, grad school suggests that women earn about 50% uh, less than men. Right? And they are you know, the same. They've gone through exactly the same education. It's a massive gap in earnings. 
Now, when we try to kind of then dig in and understand what's behind this massive gap in earnings, what we started seeing are, you know, not surprisingly, um, small but still there differences in the labor supply of these men and women. I should say, this graph here does not impute zero to the women that are no longer in the workforce, right? This is done solely on men and women that are still working whenever I'm, you know, I put them in my data set. So the kind of differences in labor supply that we observed, you know, kind of really are related to actual experience and hours worked. So if you look at, you know, actual experience, so share that has taken any kind of uh, time out of the workforce, well, obviously, at the time they leave school, that's very small. But when you go 10 plus years out, you have now 40% of women that have taken a period of at least six months out of the workforce since they graduated. Another dimension of labor supply that, you know, you can look at and, you know, They've taken some time off. They've not taken a huge amount of time off, right? If you look, you know, kind of 10 years out, the cumulative years of not working for women is only one year. It's not like these women are all the way before us for a long time. They're all the way before us for a short amount of time. But they are way more than men. You know, similarly, you see differences in terms of hours worked. At the time men and women leave our program, they work on average about the same um lengths of hours per week. When you go 10 plus years out, you see a gap that emerges between men and women. Now, what we did then next is just the obvious point, which is how much of the gender gap in earnings, this 50% gap in earnings that I just discussed, can be accounted for by these labor supply type variables, right? The fact that women have taken more time out, the fact that they work slightly shorter week. And this is what this exercise does. So the first column is essentially what's the gap in earnings between men and women, the raw gap in earnings. At the time of... Um, Leaving the MBA program, it's about 8%, 9%. 10 years out, it's 56%, the numbers that I reported before. And then what is remarkable is that simply controlling for these differences in actual labor market experience and accounting for weekly hours work, take this 50% gap in earnings down to 9%. Right? We haven't explained everything, but we have explained a huge amount by simply accounting for these labor supply um, differences. All right. Um, this is a picture that I showed you before. And what Claudia Golden did in this work is try to kind of build, I think, the bigger narrative around the result like this one. Right? One way to look at these results is that if you take business, and people have looked at the law and have found very similar stories, <coughs> these are the kind of occupations where the rewards for sticking it, not taking time off, are very large. These are also the kind of occupations where if you work a 10% longer week, you're going to get rewarded not by 10% of higher earnings, but more than 10%. Right? So they are really strong reward for working very hard in those occupations. And women might really do much more poorly than men in occupations that have those features. Right? So the way kind of Claudia put this stuff together is by putting this picture in the next one. So this is the one I showed you before, right? Women do more poorly in the highest earnings occupation. The gender gap in earnings is particularly large uh, as, you, um, as, you, as, as the average wage uh, for men occupation increases. Now, here's another picture that does the following thing. So on the, on the y-axis, you still have the gender gap in earnings within a particular occupation. What is on the x-axis now is, a sense, in a sense, a measure of what I, showed, what I asked you before. In this occupation, if you, if you work 10% longer week, does your earnings go up by 10% or by 20% or by 5%? Right? And the kind of occupations where your earnings increase a lot when you work a slightly longer week are going to be further to the right on the x-axis. These are occupations where the, there's a lot of non-linear pay. There's rewards for working very long hours. And what you can see again here is this negative slope. That way to interpret this negative slope in this context is that women do particularly poorly compared to men in those occupations where the reward for working long hours is particularly large. Does that make sense? So I think that really just really encompasses this, this, this concept of like the inflexibility is particularly costly for women. Now, spend a bit more time on this picture and realize that there are really differences among these higher earnings occupations in the economy across sectors of the, uh, of the economy, right? So the red dots tend to be further to the right. Those are the business-related occupations. 
I think you may want to contrast that with, you know, technology, where in technology, the earnings gap are actually smaller than they are in business. In technology, occupations are also occupations where earnings are, earnings are more linear in the amount of work that you, uh, that you do rather than convex. Okay? All right. So if uh, I've convinced you that this, uh, this inflexibility concern is, is, is first order, you may ask yourself, well, what's behind this? You know, why is it more costly to women than men uh, to, you know, um, uh, to, to work in an occupation that requires such inflexibility? I think now we are pretty um, comfortable with saying that the first order explanation is really children. And that may not be so surprising, but here are a few pictures. So this is back to the work that we did on our Boost MBA students. And this is understanding the differences in labor supply between, uh, between men and women. Remember why this is important? Because the difference in earnings really are explained by these differences in labor supply. And what you're going to, what you see here is essentially the way I like to present this is that it's not about two groups. It's not about man versus woman. It's about men versus women with kids and women without kids. And essentially men and women without kids exhibit about the same labor supply. The group that is really different from the first two is women with kids. You know, you can illustrate this by looking at, you know, let's take the last columns, uh, the, the weekly hours worked. There is a gender gap in weekly hours work that is about 9% between men and women. But when you make the contrast, not simply man versus woman, but man versus woman with kids and woman without kids, you can see still a small differences here, 3%, but the huge difference is over there. Women that have kids work about a 25% shorter week than, uh, than men do. All right. Now, this is my, uh, my Sweden uh, picture which um, I also have one for Denmark, just to keep everybody happy. Um, this is not, should be very clear, this picture is not um, focused on, say, people with MBAs. This is the entire population of Sweden. But the story it tells, I think, is just, uh, I think, pretty remarkable. Um, and again, the reason why I find this picture just remarkable is it's because it is Sweden. Right? So when you look at the countries where I think these forces will be the most minimal, I think Sweden and Norway and, uh, and Denmark and maybe Finland. So what they've done here is essentially track the earnings over time of husbands and wives, which you can do very easily because of the very rich data you guys have. Um, and you can see the event over here is the birth of the first child for the couple. And you can see that in the year prior to the birth of the first child, there is a gender gap in earnings, right? Uh, but men's and women's earnings basically track each other very well and what is going up. What you see here is just this massive disruption to the woman's earnings at the time of the first child being born with very little happening to, uh, to the husband's earnings. And what is further, you know, more very remarkable is that there's really no recovery going on, is that these two trend lines basically remain parallel to each other after the birth of the first child. This is data from Denmark that tells exactly the same story. Um, they've normalized um, the, the difference between men and women, so you should not uh, make too much of, of the gap between the two, um, the average gap between the two, but essentially this is the birth of the first child. Nothing happens to the men's earnings. Women's earnings take a huge dip and never recover. And when you look for, you know, kind of the pattern that you'd expect, expect to see, uh, given I told you before on variables related to labor force participation, labor supply, you see again the same story. Huge reduction in hours work for women, nothing, uh, nothing happening to men. All right. Um, this story, this picture, I think is an attempt by the people that did the Danish study to try to say, okay, so if I look at Denmark today and I try to explain the gender gap in earnings overall, how much of it can be attributed to this kind of dynamic? How much of it has got to be something else, right? And let's do this today, but let's also go back three decades ago and let's try to understand the gender gap in earnings three decades ago. And what this picture says essentially is that today in Denmark, the gender gap in earnings is essentially only this story. There's nothing else left um, to talk about. If you were to go back three decades ago, one of the big reasons why women were earning less than men three decades ago is that women were less educated than men in the working age population three decades ago, but that's no longer the case. So the, the yellow area has disappeared. 
And in this context, you know, sometimes you cannot explain things by education or children. There's really no residual, uh, unexplained kind of residual gender gaps. The big story is really related to children. Okay. How am I doing on time? Okay, great. Perfect. So what I'm going to finish with is, is um, kind of a bit of a reflection as to whether the story I've told you so far that at the core, this is really about, you know, in the inflexibility of high earnings occupations and women paying a higher price uh, here because they are less flexible than men because of the demand they face at home, whether these results should be puzzling if you think about today's society. Um, it's very true that, you know, women remain physically um, the provider of children. None of that has changed. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of forces that should have been, should be working, uh, towards reducing the extent to which women are paying a disproportionate price for, uh, this, uh, inflexibility. And in particular, um, think about what has been happening with non-market work and think about what's been happening with, uh, with gender role attitudes. And let me talk about both of these, right? If you go back to, you know, kind of four decades ago, three decades ago, the, the non-market work demand on women's time were much, much higher than they are, than they are today, right? There's an ability now to outsource many things and this ability to outsource either to technology or to people, a lot of what should be happening in the home is particularly large for the kind of women that should be filling in the gender gap because they have the ability, the means, uh, the means to do that. So, I, I think it is indeed puzzling that these forces are still so relevant, despite the fact that the amount of non-market work has been going on. And I'll have a full, uh, a full explanation for this, but in the context of the U.S. at least, I think there's been one force uh, that I think people are only starting to spend some time thinking about, is that what is true that the amount of time that people spend um, doing the dishes has been going down, there's one thing that's been going up over time in the U.S., particularly in the more educated families, and it's the amount of time people spend with their children. And um, while, uh, while, so while general non-market work might have been going down, the amount of time spent on children has been, has been going up. And I think people are still trying to understand that, whether this could be related to uh, the increase in income inequality, the fact that every you know, kind of well-off family wants to get their kids into Harvard, and so you don't want to outsource you know, child care to you know, a third party. You want a highly educated mom to be taking care of the kids. I don't quite know the explanation, but I think this is an important force, at least in the U.S. context. I don't know much outside of the U.S. And then finally, let me tell you a bit about, you know, kind of gender role attitudes. If the problematic is that women are the one um, that are supposed to be in charge of everything that has to do with, you know, with children and with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the home, um, we have seen some changes over time in how strong these perceptions are, right? So you can look at world value surveys, if you want to do something worldwide, you can look at the GSS. If you want to look at the US, there's no doubt that the gender uh, role attitudes have become less conservative over time. Uh, that force, again, I think should reduce the strengths of some of the dynamics that, I've, uh, that I described. Now, I do want to point on this front that if you look at each you know, when we measure gender norms, we ask people subjective questions. Do you think women should be at work? Do you think they should be competing with men? Do you think it's okay for a child to, you know, be raised by a working mom? It is true that on all these questions, the answers have moved more and more in a more liberal kind of dimension, more gender neutral dimension. The one question that has not moved as quickly are the views towards having a child uh, that has a working mother. That one has been, you know, certainly more sticky. The other thing I'd like to say about gender norms is that the way we, you know, kind of measure gender norms does not cover all aspects of what makes someone more uh, gender conservative or, or gender liberal. So in, you know, some work that, that I did recently, we focused on the following norm, which is that men should not be out-earned by their wives. That's a norm that, you know, was not relevant four decades ago, because four decades ago, that was not even a question. Men would not have a wife that earned more than them. If you look today in the US, there is a sense that men, many men still react very negatively to the idea they're going to be all earned by their spouse. And I guess I'll finish with, uh, with this, which is an illustration of how relevant these norms still are today, even when you start looking at 
more selected groups of individuals where you think that these norms will not be relevant. Well, this is work that was done by uh, Amanda Pelle and uh, Leo Bernstein and uh, Thomas Fujiwara. Um, they, uh, they worked with a group of MBA, I think it was UCLA MBAs, and they did a bit of a, a little, little experiment with them. So they, um, they asked the students to fill in a survey that would actually be, you know, something uh, of, uh, of consequence. That would be a survey that was going to be used for the placement in internships. And uh, in the survey, they were, the students were asked questions about um, how much, you know, what's, what was the desired compensation, um, how, much, how many days a week they were willing to travel for their job. Um, and then they, uh, they did the following manipulations. They told a random subset of these students before they filmed the surveys that the results of the surveys would be discussed in a public manner with other students in the, in the classrooms. That means your answers will become public. And they told another random group of students that their answer to the survey would be discussed, but in a confidential manner. So their answers would not be made public. And what they did after that is essentially compare an answer to this question between men and women in the MBA program, but also breaking them down as to whether they were married or were single and hence still looking for a spouse. And what they found is that this is the responses to the desired compensation questions among sin- single male uh, and female, um, male, sorry, single female students, single male students. And these are the results among non-single female and non-single males. And what you can see here is that when these female MBA programs that are still looking for a spouse answer the question about desired compensation, knowing that whenever they're going to have to discuss the answers, there'll be guys in the room that might be their future spouse that may not like the idea that they are very ambitious. These women respond uh, that the desired compensation is lower than they would otherwise. You see the same story over here when you look at response to the question of like, how many days per week are you willing to travel? If I'm a single MBA student, and I know that, you know, the guys in the class are going to know my answer. I'm going to d- respond that I don't want to travel as much uh, than maybe I truly want. So whether this is these women wrongly believing that these men that they could marry are going to be judging them or whether their expectations are right about the views of these men, this suggests that perceptions about gender attitudes still very much matter. All right. So... I'm not going to talk about this, but we will move it to the policy, discuss- the policy part of the discussion. I-, I think if you look at these results, take them um, for granted, then we can have, I think, a nice conversation about what are policies that could uh, be useful, what are policies that could backfire, what are policies that I do not expect to have much of an effect. What I'm going to do instead is just conclude, you have not, word, uh, you have not heard the word sexism and discrimination, I believe, in the last 20 minutes. I just want to be very clear. Um, I think I got into trouble about this before. I am certainly not uh, arguing and I'm not believing that discrimination is not a factor and that sexism is not relevant. Uh, But what I do strongly believe is that we can explain a lot of what's going on in uh, the labor market and the glass ceiling without uh, talking about discrimination. Okay. Um, So that's the one thing. Overall, I think... The trends are moving in the right direction. Some things are moving very fast, such as the educational change. Some things are moving more slowly. Um, and um, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, so we will hold off discussion. We will have questions from the audience. We will have a discussion, panel discussion with Marianne, Joachim, and Johanna later on. So I instead want to give the floor to Johanna. She's a professor of economics. Uh, she's specialized in labor economics and political economics. And she's a professor at another research institute at Stockholm University, the Institute of Social Research. The floor <laughs> is yours. So I'm very happy to be here to give uh, three comments on the talk. First, um, high income jobs are dominated by men in other countries. What are some data in the Swedish case? So among firms that are listed on the Swedish stock market, we also see that women are underrepresented in the company boards. These uh, leadership teams, uh, Företagsledningar and CEOs, just increased this year to 9%, but still very low then compared to uh, lower paid jobs. 
So looking specifically at the top percentiles of the income distribution, the gray line shows that from the 1970s, women's share of top 10% income earners in Sweden increased from 12 to 25%. <clears throat> and the, the black line shows that women are even less present among the top 1%. So something that's been pointed out about these top earners is that the women and men among these top earners have different types of relationships. Men are more likely to be married, and they're married to a person that earns the bottom half of the income distribution, whereas women are less likely to be married, and women tend to be married to someone who is also a high-income earner. So my second comment then is related to, given these other factors that we heard of, Maybe we can discuss a bit more the role of couple formation for women reaching these top jobs and remaining in those jobs. So I think that the labor market has become gender equal much faster than the marriage market in Sweden. This means that top ability women, they tend to marry other top ability men and have careers that or families that focus around the two careers or also even um, couples that focus around the husband's career. So we know from experimental work that men shy away from ambitious women, and we also saw just now that women hold back their ambitions to be more attractive on the dating market. So do women's relationships suffer more stress and strain when they're promoted to these top jobs, uh, which could be driven by the fact that they are in different types of families, Uh, in my work, I studied the probability to remain married after being promoted to three top jobs in the Swedish economy. In the political sector, promotions to mayor and parliamentarians, and then also to CEOs. So for politicians, we know both candidates who win and lose these promotions. In the Swedish municipality, you essentially have like a top person from the right block of parties and a top person from the left block of parties competing to become mayor, kommunstyrelseordförande. So we pick out all these people that compete for this job. And then for parliamentarians, we pick out marginal ranks on the electoral ballot. So if a party wins four seats in the parliament, the fourth person gets into parliament and the fifth person does not. So there we also have winners and losers of the promotion. And so we pool these people and we take out the ones that are married four years before the election. And we look at the proportion that remain married year by year. So we start with 100% married men and women, and we move year by year up to the election. And then we see in the top left graph from year one, when the women that are promoted that make up the black line get their promotion, they become less likely in each year to remain married to their spouse. And we don't see any impact of the promotion on the marriages of men. And what the graph below does is just to estimate statistically the difference between these two lines in each year compared to year zero. So this is now just that women become less likely to remain married, the promoted women, compared to the non-promoted women after the promotion. Um, so for CEOs, we don't have data for candidates, but we can look at men and women who did become CEO. So now the left graph just shows that for men and women who both become CEOs, when women become CEOs, they start divorcing faster than the men that become CEOs. Um, so one way to relate this to the type of household that people are in is to divide women's households into more or less gender equal. So here we split the data by the age gap as a measure of how gender equal the relationship is. So on the right hand side, we can see the black dots for women are all around zero. So there's no impact from the promotion on divorce for women who are in more gender equal couples with where the spousal age gap is less than four years. But on the left-hand side, for women that are a lot <laughs> like younger than their spouse by a larger margin, there we see a much stronger impact uh, of the promotion on the divorce probability. And the divorce probability tri uh, triples compared to the baseline rate uh, among people in these like women with high ability that reach the top, 
but they are in these gender traditional marriages. So, women tend to not be in the types of relationships that give the most career support, and there are signs that there's more stress and strain on women's relationships from their promotions to the top. So. Essentially, I think、uh, we can at least discuss that it's kind of a problem that women don't really have these relationships to a lower earning spouse. And if, as in the Swedish case, we've been pushing the dual earner family, but if both people have high income jobs, given the pressures of these jobs, you'll essentially never see each other. So, which policies could allow for more women-led families and? Give more equal distributions of types of families, couples that we have. For example,、uh, policies could shift the intergenerational role modeling and impacts of parents on children's spousal choice.、Uh, parental leave quotas could impact on children's norms in who, what type of relationship they want. I think the Swedish policies of student loans and housing policy has made parents. Influence on children's spousal choice weaker, and I think also in the Swedish case, individual-based rather than couple-based taxation has been important in this regard.、Um, so my third and shorter comment is that we talked a lot about the gender norms in the household, and I think it's also interesting to talk about behaviors and norms in the workplace, because yes, women with children. We see them, you know, dropping out of these high-earning jobs or investing less in them over time.、Um, but what affects that trade-off for women to start investing more in building relationships with their children than investing time in their career? There can be many things that impact on that choice of the investment in the career. So, is it women that select out of the career at parenthood? Or is the variation in work environments that make it more attractive for women than for men to select out of these top-earning jobs? So, women might not be seen as very suitable for these jobs. For example, we just had Jordan Peterson visiting Sweden, and he made that argument very strongly.、Um, we know from he's very influential in, in Swedish debate right now. I think <laughs> so. Men could、uh, see. Uh, like there could be more threat against the prestige of an occupation that is male-dominated and high income when women enter, and we know from lab work that women are not, you know, risk averse when they're competing against other women, or they、uh, like to compete against themselves or with women. But it's really when there's lots of men around where women's self-confidence and willingness to compete tends to drop the most. So I just want to show two final graphs where I use Swedish data for people with tertiary education and employed.、Um, this is a proportion of, of people that support、uh, gender equality、uh, by income rank. So women tend to be very supportive of gender equality regardless of income, but for men, we see this drop where category six. These are People that earn more than fifty-five thousand per month, so the highest income jobs, we see the largest disparity where these men are the least、uh, supportive of increasing gender equality. And these are, of course, the men that these high-earning women are surrounded with in these top jobs. Here I plotted another indicator of the work environment from the Swedish、uh, Work Environment Survey, Arbetsmiljö Undersökningen. So here, each dot is the rate of self-assessed sexual harassment in the past 12 months within a high-earning occupation. So I think it's interesting to see that the more men to the right, we see higher share of men. There is more self-reported sexual harassment in these different occupations, and actually, academia is one of the ones that have significantly higher、uh, average here. So I think when we want to understand、uh, how women make different choices after they become parents in these male-dominated, high-earning environments, it's important to also discuss norms and behaviors. I think in the workplace, rather than just、uh, those that come from the home. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jonna. Um, so Joachim, he, Joachim is a researcher is interested in corporate finance, entrepreneurship and labor economics at the Research Institute for Industrial Economics here in Stockholm. Okay, thank you. I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. Um, I was asked to give a, a comment um, on the glass ceiling from a Swedish perspective. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about executives. Um, and this is joint work with uh, Matti Kelloharju and, and, and Samuel Knufer. So uh, when you look at the labor force in general in Sweden, roughly 50% are men, 50% are women. But once you get to executives, only 21% are women and only 8% are CEOs. Now, while we know a lot about uh, gender gaps in the population in general, uh, we know relatively little about these gender gaps in, among executives and what contributes to these gaps among executives. And it's not necessarily the case that things uh, we've studied in the population transfer to executives because they self-select uh, based on their traits or their ambitions. It's also the case that they face different opportunity costs of dropping out of the labor force. And they also have different resources, for, ex or, for example, arranging with, with alternative childcare arrangements. So what we've done is we've gone out and we've looked at all the executives in Sweden in 2011 who were in their 40s and who got their kids roughly in the 90s. And we've studied these gender gaps. So the first thing you can uh, uh, see is that there are large gender gaps in both appointments and in pay. So, for example, among all executives, 1.4 of all male executives is a top firm, a uh, large firm CEO, whereas it's only 0.8% of all female executives which are a top firm, firm CEO. It's also the case that less um, uh, female executives relative to male executives tend to be large firm top executives. So this is a top executive team. And they're also less likely to be a very highly paid executives. So among all male executives, 14.3% earn more than a million a year, whereas among all female executives, only 9.6% uh, earn more than 1 million a year. Now, one of the things you often hear uh, when you talk about top firm executives is that, well, you know, um, women are not reaching the top of the corporate hierarchy because they're not qualified for these top jobs. Well, one of the great things about Sweden is we have this fantastic registry data. So we can go out and come up with over 60 different qualifications for the top jobs, and we can compare them across genders in this sample of executives. So here I'm going to show you a few uh, selected qualifications that tend to favor women. So women have more of these qualifications that qualify them for the top job in a firm. So ex for example, women are much more likely than men to have a university education. They tend to come from business and economics uh, tracks. They tend to come from elite schools to a greater extent. Uh, they have more varied work experience. They've worked more in investment banking and consulting. They have parents of higher socioeconomic status. And it's also the case that their brothers score higher on IQ scores, are more likely to be leaders, and are, have better uh, grades in school than the brothers of male executives. Now, of course, there's a bunch of characteristics as well for which males are better suited for the top jobs than, than females. So these are selected qualifications that favor men over women. So, for example, uh, having an engineering degree prepares you for a top job, and men tend to have an engineering degree to, the more, to a higher extent than females. They also have more labor market experience. Uh, they have more tenure with the firm. They tend not to have worked in nonprofits, which is a measure of altruism here. Uh, and they tend to come from roles in the firm um, which prepare you for the top jobs. So they come from productions, operations, sales, and marketing roles, but they're not coming from personnel, IR, advertising, and PR roles, which are typically filled with women. It's also the case that they're more likely, they're, uh, they're more risk tolerant as measured by stock market participation in their per personal portfolios uh, than what women are. And this is also predictive of reaching a, a top corporate role. Okay, so we can take all of these qualifications and we can see, okay, so how much of these gaps in appointments and pay can we explain by these bundles of characteristics? Well, it turns out, not anything. In fact, these gender gaps become larger once you start controlling for these qualifications. Now, this is a reflection of the fact that among these executives, the selected set of people, women are better qualified um, uh, for the top jobs than what men are. Once you, can, once you account for all these different qualifications. Uh, 
Okay, so what can explain these gender gaps? Well, we can go back to these studies um, which have talked about child penalties in the population. And this is a sort of, it's, it's probably a first order explanation in the, in the population, so it might be a first order explanation here as well. So when we go back and look at the careers of these people who end up in executive roles, uh, we see this kind of pattern. It's very apparent that in terms of labor income trajectories, the differences between men and women uh, uh, start appearing around the time you typically form a family. So um, uh, when you focus in on that date, you sort of see these types of figures where this shows you the careers around childbirth, uh, males versus females, and these are people who then become executives in the future. You see that independently on when you get your kid, if you get it earlier or, or late, the career trajectories of males or females who end up becoming executives are very similar um, until the time of childbirth, and then it sort of drops down, and then it slowly recovers uh, over time. But 10 years out, you still have a 14% uh, gap in earnings among male and females who, become, who, who will become executives. Now, a lot of other things also happen around this time. For example, women are not uh, sort of looking for new jobs and advancing in their careers by moving to jobs to the same extent that men are. There's a five-year window around getting kids where women tend to stay put in their jobs. Um, uh, it's also the case that they have more days absence for work for parental reasons and they work fewer hours up until the kids are around 10 years of age. Now, uh, another thing we can do is we can, we can look at within couples. Now, one thing which is very apparent in the data is that if I were to plot the income trajectories for the, peop for the male executives, there's going to be no bump at all around the time you form your, fa your, fa your family. Now, what we try to do in this figure is we're, we're looking at all, only female executives, and we're comparing female executives who have high potential partners, so those who are, you know, uh, get kids with the investment bankers and the consultants, to the female executives who have partners who are sort of flipping burgers, very low potential partners who are not on these career tracks. And you sort of expect there to be some sort of within family optimization here, whereas you get more support of the, peop of the male spouse with, with, with less potential. But there's absolutely no difference here whatsoever. So independently of the potential of your partner, it is the case that women always took the highest hit. And this is, remember, this is sort of in the 90s in Sweden, and these people became executives in 2011. So this is very much consistent uh, with uh, strong norms prevailing in the 90s around uh, sort of who should take care of kids. Okay, you, if you try to explain the gender gaps in appointments and pay for executives uh, with these child penalties, which are measured, by the way, 15 years ago, it turns out you can explain uh, 60 to 100 percent of these uh, gender gaps um, uh, just by uh, the child penalties or income around the time you, you, you form, your firm, for, form your family. Okay, so to summarize, there are large gender gaps in appointments and pay in Sweden among, among executives, and these observable differences in qualifications cannot explain the gaps. You cannot say that the women are not qualified for the top jobs. Instead, these child penalties play a very prominent role, and I think this sort of suggests that, fo uh, that policy should focus on this early career progression. I also think this paints sort of a picture that we're looking at very slow-moving trends now. So if you want to understand why today there are so few women at the top of the corporate hierarchy, you have to go back and look at what structures prevailed in the 90s in Sweden when these people were building their careers. Uh, I think, think they're still pr playing, playing a big role. So I, I want to end with an appeal uh, to all the executives here, the, the role models and decision makers within the firm, to sort of go back and, and, and think a little bit about sort of what norms around taking time off with kids or caring for si sick children prevail within your firm, and how can you make those norms more gender neutral? Um, and with that, I'll uh, end. Thanks. So thank you so much, all the three of you. Uh, three of you. Uh, so I would like to have you all the three of you on stage, and we will have time for questions and discussions with the audience. Uh, so um, 
one thing I noted in the discussion was that, I mean, the, the figures, um, not all of the figures you showed were, 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 the, were about the development over time. So we don't know so much about this. For example, in Joachim's data, it's like a, it's all those that had kids in, kids in the 90s. Uh, but Marianne showed some pictures about that the, it's, we seem to, in the US, we seem to have reached the glass ceiling around year 2000, and then much, not much has, has, has happened about like women's shares of, uh, among the top earners. Whereas the data from Sweden showed something very different uh, from Johanna's presentation. Um, I think that I mean, it seems to like that. I mean, it's starting from a low level, but the share of females among the top earners are still increasing. So, can you comment on that? Is that uh, is that a general picture, or what? What does I mean? I think it's, it's yeah. basically the. So I can I just I can summarize the picture for the U.S. in terms yeah. of lo the longer term trend. I think if you look at labor force participation, which is you know kind of the gap in that. Uh, the U.S. essentially saw improvement until about the mid-1990s, and since then, we've reached a plateau. So the share of college-educated women that are participating in the labor force is essentially the same today as it was in the mid-1990s. There's been no, no more progress. And I think the U.S. is different from other OECD countries in this regard, where women's labor force participation has been keeping on increasing. So... Um, in terms of the earnings gap, again, kind of the U.S. perspective is that if you look at, uh, again, college educated and the share of women in um, kind of the, the, the upper part of the income distribution, you seem to see progress up until about the 2000s, maybe mid 2000s and essentially stagnation since uh, for the last 15 years. So that's a U.S. picture. Yeah, so I think in Sweden, statistics are slowly inching upwards over time, and it's still increasing, I think. Um, maybe an interesting perspective on that is sometimes Sweden is put forth as a paradox where we have very generous parental leave, so women enter the labor force, but then they drop out, they don't reach the top. But by now, I think Sweden has, I mean, at least reached or even exceeded uh, the rates of women on higher jobs compared to the United States. For example, CEOs is higher now. So I think that's kind of an interesting... Yeah, so I think, I, I, I think I, I'm very much looking forward to replicating my paper in 20 years mm -hmm. because I think the norms in Sweden has changed a lot during the last 20 years. Um, and, you know, I'm from Finland originally. If you see there, I mean, in Finland, you're still stuck with the norms you had in the 90s. So it's a massive difference sort of studying in Finland and, you know, having your friends there who go out and form a family and the expectations uh, on males there for sort of taking out parental leave and caring for the family is entirely different here compared to in Finland. But I think, you know, I think we're going to see even more progress in Sweden, you know, and not necessarily so in, in Finland. They've get, I mean, when, it's like... Sweden is always hailed as this place where it's very general, where, where we are sort of very progressive in these things, but it's come now and we're still sort of stuck with the trends um, or, and the structures which, which prevailed in the 90s when it comes to the top part of the income distribution. So do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, down there. I'm a bit curious about this um, high reward for inflexibility um, and you have this graph by Claudia Goldin where there are some sectors where it's uh, very important to be mm -hmm. on the time to have very very long hours in some others it's not so it, why do you think it's that so, can there be some kind of institutional discrimination into this reward structure or, or is there yeah. another reason for it? I mean, that's a, that's a great question and, uh, you know, a difficult one to answer. Um, I think some of these differences, I think, are really related to the production function in those jobs. Uh, you know, if you think about uh, the the work of a consultant, you know, kind of you're going to have to be, if you have a client... Uh, the expectation is you're going to have to be ready 24-7 to, you know, kind of respond to the demand of, uh, of this client. Uh, if you contrast that, so that's a business example, contrast that with a uh, kind of technology job where, you know, kind of you have to finish the code, but it doesn't require much interaction with people and you don't have to pick up the phone. And if you want to work from... 
two in the morning, five in the morning, whether I'm working in the afternoon, that's fine as long as you get the work job, the, the job done. I mean, those two examples, I think, tell you that there's a matter that is really about the production function uh, in those industries. The point that you are raising beyond that is whether, gosh, you know, have executive inside of corporations spend enough time to think about the way they are designing these jobs. Could they achieve the same productivity for the same, you know, amount of, uh, of, of, of investment uh, by structuring these jobs differently? And I think that to me is really an open, you know, an open question. Um, there might really be ways, and you could imagine that the pressures that we talked about at the beginning where now firms, if they want to find talent, are going to have to be responsive to the fact that this talent is more and more female because of the educational trend that I just discussed. So I'm guessing that we'll see changes simply coming from the fact that firms now are going to have to think harder about how they can get the most out of these female talents and think about restructuring jobs in a way that, you know, kind of make it easier to retain, uh, to retain women. So, so I just want to ask you, Akim, you, you seem to think that there, I mean, you appeal to executives in the audience to change their, <laughs> I mean, you seem to think that there is a lot of scope for, kind of, so it's not given kind of exogenous by the industry structure or whatever. I mean. Well, I think um, it's been, it's been, this is one of the first gender papers I've written and it's been sort of a very fun journey. It's sort of my, my, my views on what matters has changed a lot during m multiple times. I think, I think norms are, are really important. Uh, and I think you can set norms at a country level, and I think maybe the daddy months have, have helped creating sort of a norm in Sweden where it's okay for men to sort of um, take, care of, take care of kids. But you can also set norms within, within firms, and you know, what you talk about in the coffee room and sort of what, what's the expectation, how many months are you going to be on leave, who, who stays home to take care of the kid. I think that's, those types of norms can be influenced, and it's executives uh, who can influence them. Uh, and I think that's sort of a, a something which we can do a lot more work on. Um. So I see Per sitting ready with Mike. So please yeah. introduce yourself before. So you uh, I'm Per Strömberg, professor of finance at the SSC. Hi. Um, so I have uh, two questions. So the first one: it seems, uh, uh, at least in Swedish data, that when a profession that the fraction of women increases within the profession, then there's a gender gap that increases in that profession. So, so, it's, so it's not just like even men working in female-dominated professions earn less than men working in more male-dominated professions. And I think I've seen some evidence that it also seems to hold in the time series. So I'm wondering whether you have seen any evidence like that. And uh, the second thing uh, related to what you showed then is that when you start controlling for, let's say, occupation and so on, you might actually be over-controlling a little bit for the gender gap. Yeah. And then I had a short second question, which have to do whether anyone has looked at whether men, I mean, this would be interesting in Swedish data, whether men are penalized not about the time they have kids, but if they actually take longer time off for parental leave. So I'll get the. I'll start with the second part of what I mean, if you asked me. So when we do the, you know, kind of the particular exercise, we control. The, the, there's the idea there was to actually not control for which industry you are in, or which occupation you have, or which size firm you work in, because we viewed all these variables as like clearly endogenous and would fall into the, you know, over controlling, you know, aspect. So the point was to demonstrate there that, you know, kind of just simply putting, you know, kind of actual experience, time off, and uh, and hours worked, um, explain all the gaps. So if I'd thrown in on top of that, you know, firm size, industry occupations, I could probably have revert this, you know. Oh, okay. So the first part of the question, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure I understood it. Yep. Being a doctor and being a teacher were very, you know, high income jobs maybe in the past. And then you see, you know, the prestige and, and relative pay of those jobs seem to go down over time. And that seems to go hand in hand with more women being in those occupations. I'm wondering whether there's any research along those. Uh, yeah, I think there's, there, there is some work that is more kind of related to how men may try to move out of some occupations when the share of women kind of in those occupations increases because... I mean, in one way to interpret it is again via some kind of gender identity perspective, like this is no longer kind of a man's kind of job. Yeah, so just adding on Swedish data, I think what we know about the cost of parental leave is that the penalty is larger for men that take leave 
you see bigger reductions in wage. So the explanation I think that people have put forth to that is that for women, the firm has already internalized the cost or they expect the women to take leave. But for men, it's, since it's more uh, optional, it's seen as a stronger commitment signal to the firm. Do we have more questions? Yeah. So wait for a mic and please introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Heidi Borgen from the uh, governmental offices. Um, I would like you to reflect a little bit on this uh, statement that um, in the U.S. Uh, it's considered better for your children if you have a stay-home mom. Uh, I also heard this from other countries in Europe, but in Sweden, you rather would think that it's better for your kids uh, to be in preschool and have a working mom. Uh, and how can you get a change in this attitude? In U.S., not in Sweden, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so that's that's th that's a tricky one. I'm not sure whether I made the statement. The statement that I, the statement that I made certainly is that among the higher educated couples in the U.S., the amount of time people are spending with their children is being is being going up. Um. I mean, one. So I'm not going to talk here about a particular paper because I don't. I don't think that that paper exists. But I mean, maybe, maybe the maybe the, the one paper by Ramey and Ramey is a little bit along those lines. I think there is a sense. So I'm going to talk about it also as a mom. <laughs> um, there is a sense from a very early age that parents, especially kind of well-off parents, want to get their kids ready to go to Harvard. <laughs> uh, and I think if you want to get your kids ready to go to Harvard, a stronger force to raise those kids, a more, you know, kind of uh, a force that's going to be more productive is going to be, you know, a mom that has, you know, a Harvard, you know, a Harvard college degree. And she's going to do a better job probably than most, you know, kind of most... Uh, you know, child care provider that, you know, you could outsource the child raising to. I think there is the, the peer, pr the pressure to invest in your children from a very early age in the U.S. Again, I'm talking here more like a, more as a mom than an academic, are extremely large. Um, and this work that Rame and Rame did a few years back, I really tried to think about this. Like, you see those places where, you know, the pressure to get into the top colleges are the highest is the place where you've seen more increase in, uh, in parental investment in kids. Uh, what can I do? So, uh, I mean, I think one, it could be a good sign that parents are investing more, you know, they're spending more time in building human relationships yeah. with children rather than extending work hours and having this, like uh, doing high stakes sports at work or investing at other things in like a very high stakes uh, work environment. But um, I mean, one way of if you want high educated mo mothers to spend to to reduce that invest time in their children one way of doing that could be to raise of course the quality of the public child care Absolutely. i mean i'm at a american school this yeah. year and there four years old four year olds have stem education which is really strange they have stem curriculum where they like play with dirt and yeah. water and it's seen yeah. as like their first entry way into later doing like a stem you know getting into a high stem job so I think like there's really uh, an interplay here with like the quality yeah. of the public. Absolutely, absolutely. There's also very limited good options. You know, if if you work and want to go back to work immediately with a small mm -hmm. child, the idea of having like childcare, you know, on ground on the ground in you know in the building sounds extremely appealing. I think that's going to be a great great policy if you're a company that wanted to kind of keep you know keep their women. Very few very few firms in the U.S. have you know have that. Yeah, and that's even with the. Uh, they get the tax subsidy if they do it, right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, Marianne, what you think about like should if, whether the U.S. should try to copy kind of Nordic country style places <laughs> like uh, extended parental leaves and <clears throat> subsidized high quality child. Well, care. I mean, I think as as you mentioned before, the you know the parental leave, the extended parental leave policy, I think could especially maternity leave, if you call extended maternity leave, I think in many ways is a bad policy if your goal is this. Right? I think. 
you know, kind of longer kind of maternal leave, I think, are going to be associated with more, more women remaining or re-entering, you know, kind of the labor force. But I think they're also going to be associated, you know, with the caveat of the fact that you mentioned with, um, you know, fewer women in the higher earnings job for a variety of reasons. One of them being, look, I'm, as an employer, you're asking me to hire this 25-year-old woman and to put her in charge of my top clients, but then she's going to be able to take like one I don't know how many years off when she has kids, I'm going to stay away from her. So I think maternity leave can very much backfire. Um, what I find, you know, if I were dictating U.S. policy, what I find the most relevant policy in light of the conversation that we all had today is really whatever is going to be gender, gender neutralizing uh, the asymmetry between men and women in terms of like who's taking care of the the home uh, the home environment. So I find you know kind of the the quotas you know the parental leave the daddy months the daddy quotas to be exactly the kind of policy that is about trying to address what I think is at the core of uh, of the findings. Now my reading of the evidence on the daddy quotas, but I think it's only starting to trickle in, is that it's. Okay, but not super promising so far. So, I mean, some people may have looked at these data more recently than I have, but, you know, the men stick exactly the, you know, amount of time that, you know, they have the quota for and nothing more. And this, the evidence is fairly mixed as to whether it's helping their wives' earnings. But maybe this, you know, this is too, still too early to tell. But in terms of like a policy that is most immediately targeted towards, you know, the, the root cause of this, I think that's the most appealing one that I can think of. So we, I think we have time for one last question from the audience, if we have, have a question. Yes. Um, my name is Sosi Kvart, and I'm more a reflection than a question, and it, and it it's about how you view children, because in, in, in the U.S., I mean, the children are more a uh, uh, mirror of the parents, so getting them into Harvard is more like uh, to get your um, uh, view of yourself confirmed, while in Sweden, um, well, swe children are, are viewed as individuals and that they have an own, <laughs> own will. Uh, I'm a very good example. My, my kids have low status uh, jobs. I have a brother. We are both <laughs> under the same circumstances. He's an American uh, citizen today, and he has two children, and his wife and himself yeah. are working full time to get them into Harvard. Yeah. So, I mean, it ha have you looked up on, I mean, the role of children in in different countries? Yeah. I mean, as you said, it's more it's more reflection. I guess what I w what I'm gonna say in response is just getting you to go back to the pictures that you know that I showed you before you know if there's really something special you know about the US you wouldn't see the patterns that you know kind of people have documented in Sweden in in Denmark uh you know even in places where people think about their children differently than they do uh than they do in the US but but I but uh, I will keep on saying that Somewhere, I think there's a bit of this rat race in the U.S., you know, I think related to the, you know, the rising income inequality uh, that is pushing more of these high educated mothers to, you know, to focus on the kids. Okay. Thank you so much for this uh, discussion. We have a sharp deadline, so I have to hand over to Gustav. Um, but let me ask, give you a final applause for the panel. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Marianne, uh, Joachim, and Johanna for coming here today to, to share your thoughts and research and perspectives on this uh, highly relevant issue. Um, before you go, I just want to inform you about uh, our next seminar within the scope of this format uh, of collaboration with the, the Institute, and that's held in March, where Barbara Petrongolo will come here from um, the Queen Mary University of London to talk about uh, gender gaps um, on the labor market in industrialized countries. So that's a very similar topic, but perhaps uh, uh, with a set of new perspectives as well. Um, I also want to do some promotion for um, a program that we're running at SNS. Um, that's, um, it's called SNS Summers Priam. Uh, it's held in Swedish. Uh, it's an executive education course um, that we... Um, offer to executives in the public sector and in the private sector um, where they get to 
learn about well how decisions are made in Sweden and the EU. Um, they go to Brussels, for example, for uh, a field trip, um, and uh, it's been highly appreciated uh, the last years. So um, if if you want to know anything more about this, please visit our website or just ask any uh, me or my colleagues with the, these red name tags. Um, so yeah. Thank you for today. And now you're very welcome to have a coffee outside.